My name is David Harris. I'm with the Charles Hamilton Houston Institute for Race and Justice here, and I welcome you to Harvard Law School on behalf of Dean Manning. Uh, we, we are really pleased to, to be able to, to be here this morning, and I, we applaud all of you for uh, coming out in this weather. It's, uh, it's been a real kind of kick in the head. Uh, the idea of shoveling snow this morning was a little bit obscene, uh, so I did only a little bit. Uh, so, since we have a little time, I'm going to say a, a few words before I turn it over to my colleague, uh, Bob Hernandez. But uh, I want to say months ago, when he suggested the, that, that we needed to do this, you know, I thought, oh, you know, that's true. It's a great idea. Uh, you, know, you know, I didn't really think it would happen. Uh, and, uh, you know, w when he suggested it, you know, there were, there were th so many things in the news, including, you know, right out, right out here on Mass Ave, a young man. Uh, uh, being wrestled to the ground by the police. Uh, you know, the, the, the questions at stake today uh, are, are all around us. Uh, and in thinking about today, I, I was reminded of a scene in a film that Jay Fedigan uh, did called The Angry Heart. I don't know how many of you have seen it. it it's, a, it's an incredible film. Uh, and it's really about uh, physical disease. It's about uh, a young African-American man uh, named Keith Hargrove. Uh, who had a heart attack, and the film is the story of his recovery, and uh, you know, and but it also uh, uh, is a study in the effects of racism. And there's a point in the film when Keith says, "You know, I uh, I always saw our speaker is here, so I'm gonna, yeah, this is good." Uh, he says, uh, "You know, I always thought I was like a rock on the shore, and." Uh, uh, that uh, the waves kept pounding against me and, and I kept standing. And I always thought that this was a sign of strength. And he said, but this heart attack has reminded me that in point of fact, what was happening with each wave, a little bit of me was being chipped away. Right? And, and so in some sense, I, I, have a, I have a feeling that that's, that's really an apt understanding of what, what happens uh, what the, some of the effects of racism are on us in our day-to-day -day lives. And uh, there is a way in which uh, it chips away at us and we continue to stand like rocks if we can. Uh, and uh, there are some questions of care at stake here. Uh, so, so I think what we're doing today is really important and, I, and I'm really glad to be able to do it with you. Um, so uh, I do want to get to... Uh, we're going to get to the program now that David is here, but, but I also want to say a few more words. So, you know, we often at the Institute co-sponsor events, right? We have lots of co-sponsors on our posters, you know, and, and it usually means adding a name and a logo to, uh, to our publicity. Uh, nothing could be further from the truth today. Uh, the point, the fact is uh, uh, that mental health legal advisors uh, has been uh, unbelievable in the determination, uh, insight they've brought to putting this thing together, and uh, we, we feel really, really fortunate to have them as partners here today. Um, those of you who know uh, uh, that, you know, for all of our events, who know our events know that I, I always have to give a special shout out uh, to my colleague Kelly Garvin, uh, who uh, works tirelessly, you know, uh, those of you who know us know that we're there, we are three, we are three people in this entire institute, and Kelly really does unbelievable work for us in terms of uh, m so many things, but including these events. Uh, and I, I think that this will come later too, but I also need to give a, a shout to Giselle Valdez. Uh, uh, who uh, has also, she's over there, she's not even listening, uh, has, w has worked incredibly on this event, and, and of course, uh, to my colleague, Bob Hernandez. Uh, uh, so I also, uh, given the size of the crowd and, and, and the, the work that went into today, I need to give a special shout out uh, to uh, other pieces of Harvard Law School, IT, and, uh, 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 and, and Peter, you just, I, I can't say enough about how much we appreciate what you do. Uh, catering, events, uh, uh, just really uh, put this thing together for us in ways that, uh, that make it possible for a three-person staff to, to do this. All right, some details. As you've seen, we have coffee outside. Uh, as you know, we were unable to provide lunch uh, for, 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 for this crowd, uh, but we have set aside an hour and 15 minutes. 
Uh, there are some uh, uh, sheets outside that have uh, locations of certain places to eat, and we'll put a slide up uh, just before lunch uh, to uh, uh, give you some ideas of where you might go. And then finally, just uh, someone just asked me, for those of you who don't know, the restrooms are out there and to the right. Uh, and with that, it's really my pleasure now to turn this over to my colleague, Bob Hernandez, to uh, uh, welcome you uh, in a slightly more substantive way. Bob. Thank you, David. Winter is coming. Uh, the, uh, on December 11th of last year, the Boston Globe, uh, in its spot, spotlight uh, series, had this amazing number, 247,000 to eight. Does everybody know what that refers to? 247,000 to eight. 247,000 represents the personal wealth of white Bostonians, eight represents the personal wealth of black Bostonians. With that shocking statistic, Mental Health Legal Advisors Committee began a conversation among ourselves to figure out what can we do about that. Now, that economic figure is not per se a mental health issue, but it kind of reflects such a fundamental problem in our society that we're stuck. How can we move forward until we address it? And so we had a, that discussion and we figured, what can we do about it? And what we came up with as intellectuals, of course, is let's have a conference. And so here we are. <laughs> uh, uh, David was most gracious in listening to the idea. Uh, we were very, very fortunate and privileged uh, to have the co-sponsorship of the Houston Institute. And uh, you know, I, I just want to say they have our profound thanks. But my purpose at this point is to kind of outline with you where we think this is going. And I, I want to underscore that while this is a search for truth, let's say, for all of us, uh, we're not going to find any perfect answers. And it's much more important to be asking the right questions than to chase the illusion that we're going to find all those answers today or tomorrow. So this is, in a sense, what we hope to be the beginning of a conversation on a subject that has not been in the forefront of uh, the, the discussion on race. And it should be because it reflects a, a basic problem in our society that hurts everybody. Racism doesn't just hurt black people, it hurts people who identify as white as well. It's a disruptive impact on all of our social interactions. It's a disruptive impact on our daily interactions as we go to work, as we go to school, as we cross the street. How do we address that? Uh, we're going to start with uh, 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 David Williams, Dr. Williams, uh, who's an outstanding scholar on this issue of racism as, as, as a public health issue, or th that's what we're kind of struggling with. Isn't racism a public health issue as opposed to just a social issue? Isn't it affecting our health? We'll, well, after the keynote, or we'll have time for some questions, hopefully, uh, we'll have a short break, then we'll come back and we'll begin a series of panel discussions. The first is going to be on the idea of irrational white fear. Uh, the panelists are going to discuss th this problem of living while black, in which you can't sit down in a lounge in a uh, college campus without another employee picking up the phone and calling the police because you don't look like you belong there. We're going to take a look at that and, and, and try to see the relation of that to this overall problem of racism. Uh, the, we'll, we'll then have a, a lunch break and we'll return for a discussion on the impact of everyday racism. The, we'll, we'll have a panel of, of experts, uh, experts by lived experience and experts as scholars. Uh, after a, a, another short break, we'll return and have another panel discussion on uh, racial and ethnic disparities in mental health. So we're trying to scout out today the kind of uh, theoretical and practical parameters of the problem. And uh, tomorrow, we'll resume 
with an effort to, to begin to try to solve these problems. What efforts are out there already? What sorts of reform efforts are there on issues like mass incarceration, the school to prison pipeline, uh, implied uh, unconscious racism, uh, all, all the invidious forms of racism in a society which is structurally racist. Uh, and so we'll have pan uh, two panels and discussions tomorrow. Uh, we hope that tomorrow will be largely discussions and that the panelists will be there primarily to initiate and to uh, get us moving on where, we're, where we can head with all this stuff. Uh, so, uh, on behalf of the Mental Health Legal Advisors Committee, welcome. We look forward to your participation and uh, uh, we'll proceed with the program. Thank you. So I, I, it's, my, it's my honor and pr privilege and honor to introduce our keynote speaker, uh, Professor David Williams. When we first thought about uh, doing this event, uh, uh, you know, one name came to mind as who we could, should try to get here if we could, and we're fortunate to have him here. Uh, David Williams is the Florence Sprague Norman and Laura Smart Norman Professor of Public Health at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and Professor of African and African American Studies and Sociology at Harvard University. Having said that, um, uh, I should point out to you, I will tell you that this is what his bio looks like, and that's a fairly abbreviated version. I, I would advise you to check him out and go find out for yourselves a little bit about him. What I'd like to say uh, by way of introduction is that he is a remarkable and fabulous colleague Right? He's a thought leader. He uh, is an incredibly generous with his time, as is demonstrated by his being here today. And I think he's been, he's, he's defined a field. And I think he's defined that field not only with his intellect and his work, but in his collaboration and those he has trained and influenced. Uh, if you think about who's working in this field, they have either worked with him or studied under him and uh, have continued to expand a body of work that really helps us understand uh, some of the uh, forces at work in our society specifically related to race. So uh, with no further ado, I want to welcome my friend and colleague, David Williams. Good morning. good morning. It is certainly good to be here with you today and to give you an overview of the research on race, racism, and health. Um, a lot of the work has been done not just on physical health, but on mental health as well. And I will kind of touch on both in terms of giving you a broader context. Okay, so I've entitled my talk The House That Racism Built and Its Consequences uh, for Mental Health. I want to remind you about a tragedy. Um, the loss of Malaysia Airlines Flight 370 in May of 2014. Um, it was the large loss of life, 239 passengers and crew. Um, it has been regarded, um, it has been reported to be the, the largest international search ever with um, the first month, 19 ships, 305 sorties by military aircraft. Underwater searches alone cost $155 million. Uh, the world responded to the loss of 239 deaths uh, in a dramatic fashion. I want to talk about tragedy number two. Tragedy number two is the large gaps in health in the United States. Here is data on life expectancy for blacks and whites. Life expectancy is how long the average person lives. Um, from 1950 to 20, uh, 2015, um, there's good news in the data. You can see for, for whites and for African Americans, steady increases in life expectancy over time. You can see there was an eight-year gap in life expectancy in 1950, and there is slightly less than a four-year gap in 2015, so we have made progress. The gap has absolutely been reduced. 
but a uh, 3.7 year gap is still large. If we froze the life expectancy of whites and had a life expectancy of African Americans increase at the average rate at which life expectancy has increased in the last 15 years, it will take 25 to 30 years to close the gap. In fact, you could see those kinds of numbers in the table. Look at the life expectancy of whites in 1950, 69.1 years. And let's ask how long did it take for African Americans to experience the health that whites had in 1950. It was not until 1990, 40 years later, that blacks were having the level of health that whites had in 1950. <clears throat> Scholars have calculated what the racial differences in life expectancy cost in terms of lives. Over 200 black people die prematurely every day in the United States who would not die if the health of blacks and whites were equal. Imagine a fully loaded jumbo jet taken off from Boston Logan Airport with 220 passengers and crew, and it crashes today, and another one crashes tomorrow and every day next week, and every day next month, and every day for the year. That's what we are talking about when we say there are racial disparities in health. And why isn't, is it that there isn't a larger outcry? Why isn't it that there isn't a larger mobilization of societal resources to address these inequities? Why do these inequities exist in the first place? I'm a sociologist. Socioeconomic status, I learned, is a driver of virtually every desirable resource in society. So let me give you an example. SAT test, the scholastic aptitude test that some have called in the student affluence test because of the strong relationship between SAT scores and household income. Here is national data for the United States, SAT scores in 2014 by household income, and you could see every higher level of household income from less than $20,000 a year to over $200,000 a year is associated with a higher SAT score. That raises profound questions for what this test means, what it captures, how we should use it in a society, given that what it seems to capture is the economic resources that kids are exposed to over their lifetime. What is true of SAT scores is also true of health. Here is national data for the United States from the Panel Study of Income Dynamics, looking at overall mortality uh, by household income and standardizing using um, household income of $115,000, which is about twice the median family income in the United States as the comparison. You can see this is a relative risk. Low income Americans have an overall death rate three times higher than high-income Americans. But it's not a threshold effect, it's a gradient effect. Every higher level of household income is associated with a lower risk of overall mortality. When my career started, most researchers thought that racial differences in health was simply a function of racial differences in income and education. That if you looked at blacks and whites, for example, at the same levels of income and education, race wouldn't matter because it was all about socioeconomic status. We now know that life is more complex than that. And I'm gonna illustrate that with national data for the United States, life expectancy at age 25. At age 25, the average white person lives five years longer than the average African American. So there's a large five-year gap. At the same time, socioeconomic inequalities in the United States are generally larger than racial ethnic inequalities. So the gap between whites with a college degree and whites who have not finished high school is 6.4 years, bigger than the black-white gap. And the gap within African Americans between those who have a college degree and those who have not finished high school is 5.3 years, bigger than the black-white gap. It's an right, interesting sociology of knowledge question why, as a nation, we have reported every year health statistics only by race, where the socioeconomic gaps, when we can analyze them, are typically larger than the racial ones. And I'm not suggesting we look at socioeconomic status instead of race. We need to look at them together because we learn a lot more when we do that. Because at every level of education, race still matters. So white high school dropouts still live 3.1 years longer than black high school dropouts. And as income or education increases, the gap widens. There's a 4.2 year gap among black and white with a college degree or more education. And one of the most stunning statistics I will share with you today, and remember this is national data for the United States. The best of African Americans, those with a college degree or more education, have lower life expectancy at age 25 than whites with a college degree or more education, than whites with some college, 
than whites who have finished high school. What does this tell us? There is something profound about income and education. I've shown you the education data, the same is true for income. There's something profound about income and ed education that matters for your health regardless of your race. But there's something else about race that matters profoundly even after you've taken income and education into account. So I've been part of a group of, uh, of scholars for the last 25 years or so that have been asking the question, could racism be a critical missing piece of the puzzle to understand the patterning of racial disparities in health? And so we need to talk about the house that racism built. What exactly do I mean by racism? I see racism as a societal system, not primarily residing in the beliefs or behavior of individuals, but a system, an organized system in society that categorizes and ranks individuals, disempowers and devalues those that are viewed as inferior, and differentially allocates societal resources. Central to racism is an ideology of inferiority, that some groups are better off than others, and this leads to negative beliefs, prejudice, stereotypes. It also leads to differential treatment, both by individuals and societal institutions. I think it's important to distinguish between individual and institutional discrimination, and I would argue that institutional discrimination matters profoundly, although we, we tend not to see it. So I want to give you an illustration, two examples with empirical studies looking at waiting. Researchers at Portland State University ask a question. In the great city of Portland, when a black person and a white person stands at a crosswalk intending to cross the street, does your race determine how long it takes before a driver yields for you to cross the street? And so they took three black males and three white males, dressed them similarly, put them at different intersections in the great city of Portland, and waited to see what would happen with the men demonstrating the same action to cross the street. And they found that multiple cars were twice as likely to pass a black person waiting to cross the street, and blacks had to wait 32% longer to cross the street. That's individual discrimination. We're talking about what individual drivers did as they saw the stimulus of someone waiting to cross the street. I want us to think of institutional discrimination. In the 2012 presidential election of national data for the United States, how long did people wait at a precinct to vote? On average, blacks waited 23 minutes, whites waited 12 minutes. Latinos, 19 minutes, Asian Americans, 15, Native Americans, 30, 13 minutes. None of this reflected the individual behavior of precinct workers. The precinct workers treated everyone the same at all of the precincts. However, it reflected institutional processes, where you voted, and what is the allocation of space, of financial resources, levels of staffing, the number of persons precincts served. So there were a number of administrative procedures and policies and allocation of resources, but that nonetheless resulted in dramatic inequities in how long people waited to vote. Institutional discrimination is a powerful driver of inequities in the United States. One of the mechanisms of institutional discrimination, not the only one, but the one I'm going to talk about in the interest of time, is residential segregation by race. It's a policy that was developed in the late 19th century, perfected in the early 20th century, locked in place by 1940, and has been fairly stable uh, since then. John Sell was a historian at Duke University. He wrote a book about the origins of segregation in the US South and South Africa. He showed that the framers of apartheid in the early 20th century looked across the Atlantic and saw segregation that had been implemented in the United States, and they said, brilliant. We could implement that in our country. And that's where they got the ideas of apartheid from. Importantly, Sell argues that residential segregation by race was one of the single most successful domestic policies of the 20th century in the United States. It's beneath the radar screen, but it has pervasive, powerful effects on health. And you say, what does place have to do with everything? Well, in public health today, we say your zip code is a stronger predictor of how long and how well you will live than your genetic code. Why? because your place, your, your address, determines for most Americans where you go to school, the quality of education you receive. It determines access to employment opportunities. 
It determines the quality of neighborhood environments and housing environments. It determines whether it's easy or difficult to live a healthy life in your neighborhood, access to fresh fruits and vegetables, to nearby nature, to safe places to exercise, access to physical, chemical, uh, toxic substances, access, research studies show even to primary care and referral to high quality medical care, quality of city service. All of these are patterned by place in the United States. Two of America's most eminent sociologists, both on this campus, William Julius Wilson and Robert Sampson, studying the 171 largest cities in America, said because of segregation, it's not even one city where whites live under equal conditions to blacks, and that the worst urban context in which whites reside is considerably better than the average context of black communities. What else has segregation done? Segregation is responsible for the racial inequities in health that we see in the United States in socioeconomic status and income and education. And I'm drawing here on the work of another Harvard faculty member, David Cutler. Using fancy econometric models I can't even fully describe, but, but very strong causal inferences can be drawn. Looking at a national sample of blacks and whites, he's able to show that statistically, if you could erase segregation, you would completely eliminate black-white differences in income, in education and in unemployment and reduce black-white differences in single motherhoods by two-thirds. All of these disparities are driven by opportunities linked to place. You see why Sell said that segregation is one of the single most successful policies of the 20th century. How large are these racial differences in socioeconomic status we're talking about? Here is national data for a US Census Bureau report in 2016. Household income by race, I have just translated it in a way that you can't possibly miss the point. I am standardizing on the income of whites as $1. And for every dollar of income white households receive, Asian households receive $1.23. That has to be contextualized that Asian households have more persons contributing to household income than any other income group. So if we did a per capita income measure, whites have the highest level of income. But let's look at the historically disadvantaged groups. For every dollar of household income white households received in 2016, Latino households received 72 cents, Native American households 62 cents, African American households 59 cents. Do you know what is stunning about that 59 cents figure? That is identical to the racial gap in income in 1978. You did not hear me wrong. I did not misspeak. 1978. And what was 1978? 1978 was the peak year of the narrowing of the black-white gap in income as a result of the anti-poverty policies and the civil rights policies of the 60s and 70s. The gaps were wider than that, but by 1978, they had been reduced to 59 cents. And do you want to know what happened? It hasn't been stable at 59 cents. Throughout the decade of the 80s, a decade when we had massive um, tax cuts for the wealthy, and the savaging of our social safety net. The gap widened as low as 55 cents. It wasn't until 1994 it got back up to 59 cents, and it has been up and down slightly, a penny above or below since then. Most of my students think we have made more progress in the United States than that. In 2015, the black-white gap in income is identical to where it was in 1978. And focusing on racial differences in income dramatically understates racial differences in economic resources. Because income only captures the flow of resources into the household. It tells us nothing about the economic reserves that households have to cushion shortfalls of income. We get that from data on wealth. And the latest census report on racial differences in wealth, for every dollar of wealth white households have, black households have six pennies, and Latino households have seven pennies. There are no racial differences in savings behavior at equivalent levels of income. The racial differences in wealth reflect racial differences, this is a fancy academic term, in intergenerational transfers of wealth. That means that when whites die, their heirs inherit wealth. Um, African Americans and Latinos more likely to pay for the funeral expenses when relatives die. Um, and the, the other major contributor is housing policy over time, including discriminatory policy we had in the United States, because for the average American household, the main source of wealth is home equity. And if you go back to the policies in the post-World War II era that led to the development of the suburbs and the highway system and in, encouraged home ownership in the United States, 
most of those policies explicitly um, ex prevented minorities from participating or allowed them to participate at very low levels. So that historic injustice still plays out today in racial differences in wealth. What does this tell us? That racial inequities in socioeconomic status, income and education, are not random events. They're not acts of God. They didn't just happen. They reflect the successful implementation of social policy, institutional mechanisms of racism that are doing exactly what they were intended to do, and it shows how racism has produced a truly rigged system in the United States. This segregation in the United States, Chester Pierce um, talked about hundreds of thousands of blacks living in extreme mundane environments, and I still think even the research literature has not fully unpacked the consequences of the social context in which African Americans live for their mental health. There is evidence of increased exposure to traumatic experiences and stressful life events that are patterned by neighborhood context. The concentration of poverty and poor housing and neighborhood conditions triggers a range of secondary stressors. Uh, a recent paper looking qualitatively in the city of Baltimore lays out some of the stressors that poor uh, highly segregated black neighborhoods have. Broken elevators, roach and rodent infestation, trash buildup, dampness in the walls, uh, inability to control temperatures, massive concrete structures, absence of green spaces, inadequate lighting, a lot of dark places where women could be raped, crumbling sidewalks, graffiti, uh, stresses linked to the social environment, pervasiveness of violence and criminal activity, witnessing shootings, seeing drug activity, resorting to violence to defend oneself, unsafe places to raise children, constant worry. Worry is a symptom uh, of, of, of mul multiple mental disorders, concern about role models of their children. The point I'm saying, these contexts breed a broad range of mental health symptoms. So I've talked about segregation as an institutional mechanism of racism that has consequences for health. But it's also uh, individual level discrimination that also matters for health. I began with an example of individual discrimination that came from what's called an audit study. An audit study is one of those studies when we hold everything identical and the only thing we vary is race, and we look to see what happens. And that was true by the researchers at Portland State University and put in black and white males dressed similarly. The only thing that varied was their race. There are high quality evidence, there is high quality evidence from audit studies documenting discrimination in all of these domains I listed on this slide, and this is not all of them. There are a lot more. I could entertain you for the next hour just describing these specific studies of how pervasive discrimination is in American society. But I want to talk about a subtype of these experiences, because not all the experiences of discrimination is someone even aware of. But what about those times when you're treated differentially, treated badly, that you are aware of? Martin Luther King said that discrimination is a hellhound that gnaws at Negroes in every waking moment of their lives, declaring that the lie of their inferiority is accepted as the truth in the society dominating them. If this is true, and it's a hypothesis that could be tested, then it's plausible to think discrimination could have negative effects on health. This is a study from the American Psychological Association um, using measures of discrimination that I developed. I'm showing you one of the, uh, I'll show you two slides from it. One of them is, is about discrimination from the police. Men, this national sample, this is the data for men only, will ask, have you ever been unfairly stopped, searched, questioned, physically threatened, or abused by the police? And you could see African Americans report the highest level, 39% of all African American males said they'd have that experience. Um, one of the a study that was published in The Lancet earlier this year in May with um, Jacob Bohr and, and, and some of his colleagues and myself, we documented for the first time that police shooting of unarmed African American males led to worsening mental health of the entire black community in the state in which that shooting occurred for the next three months linking two data sets, a data set on police shooting and a data set on, on mental health uh, at a state level, we were able to document that pattern. So these events are not just random events that occur, they are literally impacting mental health. But 
interactions with the police and discrimination are big events. The measure of discrimination that I have developed that has shown the strongest negative effects on health is one that's called the everyday discrimination scale. It just captures little things. In your day-to-day -day life, you treat you with less courtesy and respect. You receive poorer service than others. People act as if they think you are not smart or if they're afraid of you, or if they think you are dishonest, if they think they're better than you are. A lot of little indignities. Just to illustrate the power of the research on discrimination and its health consequences, I'm drawing on the work of Tenny Lewis, faculty at Yale University when she did this work. Every line on this study is a different published peer-reviewed scientific paper in all of the papers looking at everyday discrimination linking to a different health outcome. So higher levels of everyday discrimination predicts more rapid declines, um, more, more rapid um, development of subclinical heart disease as measured by coronary artery calcification. Predicts higher level of inflammation. Higher level of inflammation is measured by C-reactive. Protein puts you at risk for virtually all chronic diseases. Higher levels of blood pressure. Pregnant women who report everyday discrimination give birth to lower birth with infants. So it's actively affecting the health of the next generation. A study of the elderly followed over time, higher levels of everyday discrimination predicts more rapid declines in cognitive function over time. A community sample, higher levels of discrimination predicts poorer sleep. A study of adults followed over time, everyday discrimination, a high level of everyday discrimination is an independent predictor of premature death. These little indignities are literally killing people prematurely. And a study of African-American and white women looking at the relationship between everyday discrimination and, and abdominal fat, interested in separating using imaging data to separate two types of abdominal fat. There's a subcutaneous fat, the fat right under your skin. That's innocuous. The bad fat that predicts higher risk of stroke and heart disease and diabetes is what we call the visceral fat, the deep internal abdominal fat in between your internal organs. There's a dose-response relationship between exposure to everyday discrimination and visceral fat. So this slide just tells you discrimination literally kills. A broad range of outcomes is having negative impact. Let me tell you about one other specific study about discrimination. This is not the everyday discrimination skill, but another measure. Gene Brody um, is a faculty at, at uh, Georgia State University. He's been studying a cohort of African-American teenagers. He assessed their levels of discrimination at 16, 17, and 18. By age 20, I didn't say age 30 or age 40, I said by age 20, there is systematic biological dysregulation evident in these young African-Americans linked to the exposure to discrimination as a teen. Those who were consistently high have higher levels of three stress hormones, cortisol, epinephrine, norepinephrine, systolic and diastolic blood pressure, higher levels of inflammation that puts you at risk for virtually every chronic disease, and higher levels of BMI, the weight. So it's an example of how early in life we are seeing negative physiological effects linked to discrimination. Discrimination also affects mental health. Give you one example of, of a study that looked at Latino, Asian, African Americans, and Caribbean blacks in the National Latino and Asian American Study in the National Study of American Life. And what you see here is a dose response relationship for symptoms of psychotic illness between exposure to discrimination and symptoms of psychotic illness. So documenting negative mental health effects. I want to show you it's a global phenomenon. This is a, a project I worked on in South Africa. We looked at measures of discrimination similar to those in the United States and link it to 12 month and lifetime rates of disorder. And you could see that acute racial discrimination and non-racial discrimination, whether it's attributed to race or not, doesn't seem to matter, predicts higher levels of any 12 month DSM-4 psychiatric disorder in South Africa, both acute discrimination and chronic discrimination. Chronic discrimination is the everyday discrimination scale. In South Africa, predicts higher levels of discrimination as well. Just to show you, it's a global phenomenon. Here's a study from the United Kingdom. Again, looking at discrimination um, among um, disadvantaged uh, racial ethnic minorities. In the UK, they use the term BME, black and ethnic minority uh, people in the UK. And what this is showing here is the relationship between the number of experiences of discrimination that individuals have and declines in mental health over time. So this is a longitudinal study looking at exposure to discrimination and what happens to their mental health. For this is comparing to those who report no discrimination. If you report 
one event at one time point, that's the decline in mental health. If you report two de events at one time point, that's the decline. If you report more than two events at time one, and one event at time two, here's the decline. If you report two or more experiences of discrimination at both prior time points in life, there's even a more massive decline. So what we're seeing is a dose-response relationship. The more experiences of discrimination you have over time, the worse your mental health becomes. And this is a national sample from the United Kingdom as well. Just to illustrate that this is not just a US phenomenon, it's a global phenomenon. We need to think of how we can collaborate internationally to look at this. I've been interested in not only actual exposure to discrimination, but the threat of discrimination. And so when I developed the measures of everyday discrimination and major experiences, I also developed a scale I call the heightened vigilance scale. Because if you read qualitative research on experiences of discrimination, the threat of discrimination, people are taking steps ahead of time before they go outside. Let me give you an example. Started my career, career at Yale University and had a, a, a young couple that were good friends of my wife and I. The young man was a successful African-American businessman. But if his wife needed a gallon of milk and he had to the grocery, go to the grocery store to buy a gallon of milk, he would go and put on a tie and jacket to go to the grocery store to buy the gallon of milk because that, he thought, would minimize the chances he might be taken for a thug or might be abused in some way. The question is, what is the psychological and physiological toll of living at this high level of awareness that your environment is that dangerous that you're constantly seeking to protect yourself? So the questions asked in, with the experiences, after we ask them questions about the experiences of the everyday discrimination, how often do you think in advance about the kinds of problems that you're likely to experience? How often do you try to prepare for insults before leaving home? How often do you feel you always have to be careful about your appearance to get good service or avoid being harassed? How often do you carefully watch what you say and how you say it? How often do you carefully observe what happens around you? We're talking about a heightened state of vigilance. You know what researchers have documented for decades, and now we know the reason why? They have given black and white healthy people an ambulatory blood pressure measure, which is they're hooked up to a little device that measures their blood pressure at random intervals during the day and night. They don't have to stop what they're doing, they just keep it around, and random intervals, they find that. And these were people whose blood pressure was normal. And they found, among blacks and whites, young people, healthy young people, no differences in blood pressure during the day. But at night, there are racial differences in blood pressure. Why? Because everyone experiences what we call a nocturnal decline in blood pressure. Your blood pressure goes down while you go to sleep. And what they found is for African Americans, there is a decline, but it's a slight decline, a much smaller decline than for whites. In other words, African Americans are maintaining even while they're sleeping. They cannot fully relax. They have to stay somewhat alert and are monitoring what is in their environment. We now have three studies that have documented experiences of discrimination during the day account for the non-dipping of blood pressure at night for African Americans. And why is that important? Because the non-dipping of blood pressure predicts subsequent hypertension and cardiovascular disease. So it's a way in which the hostility of the environment is shaping physiological responses and health consequences. Here's one example of a study I did with Thomas Levis from Hopkins and colleagues looking at a cohort in Baltimore, finding that higher levels of vigilance predicts the risk of depression and contributes to the black-white disparities in depressive symptoms. And this is vigilance predicts health outcomes over and above the the, the contribution of actual experiences of discrimination. So the threat of discrimination is making a unique additional uh, e effect. Why does discrimination matter so profoundly? Another colleague of mine, Michel Lamont, in the Department of Sociology here on campus has been studying discrimination in Brazil and, and in the United States. And she and her students have argued that discrimination triggers what they call feelings of the defilement of self. It's feelings of being over-scrutinized, underlooked, underappreciated, misunderstood, and disrespected. And they argue they violate cultural expectations of fairness, morality, dignity, and rights. So we're talking about the house that racism built. We've talked about segregation and its pervasive negative consequences. We've talked about individual discrimination 
and its negative consequences for physical and mental health. I want to talk about cultural racism, the extent to which racism is deeply embedded in our culture and leads to negative stereotypes and stigma that in turn trigger discrimination. Negative stereotypes are prevalent in our society. Um, what I mean by that, there's research, and I'm not showing you the slides, but research shows that whites believe that blacks are lazy, that blacks are prone to violence, that um, blacks prefer to live off welfare, um, that blacks are unintelligent. Those are very common stereotypes documented in multiple studies of, of African Americans. They are deeply embedded in our culture. A group of scientists have put together a database of American culture. About 10 million words, it has the books, magazine articles, newspaper articles, the average college-educated American would read over their lifetime. What's brilliant about this, if you've got American culture in a database, you can now interrogate this database and say, when, for example, the word black appears in American culture, what adjective most commonly co-occurs with black? Poor, violent, religious, lazy, cheerful, dangerous. White, wealthy, progressive, conventional, stubborn, successful, educated. For the fun of it, female, distant, warm, gentle, passive. Male, dominant, leader, logical, strong. So if you were raised in American society, these are associations you have been exposed to just as a result of growing up and participating in this culture. The numbers next to the stereotypes is the, is the measure of associative strength. Interpret them, they're not technically, but you can interpret them as a simple correlation coefficient, that the, the larger they are, if the two things went together all the time, the number would be one, and the higher the number, the closer, um, the more frequency, frequently those um, characteristics co-occur. Here are the 10 most common stereotypes for blacks and whites, and you can see the predominance, I'm highlighting the negative ones of negative stereotypes for, for African Americans, but also that the negative stereotypes have higher associative strength, which means they co-occur more frequently. Folks, this has enormous implications of what we're facing as a society. This tells me that when a cop views a young black male as more violent and dangerous than he actually is, and overreacts, we are not necessarily dealing with a bad cop. We may be simply viewing a normal American who is reflecting what's deeply embedded in his subconscious as a result of being raised in society, this society. But this society has raised him to believe that blacks are violent and dangerous. I want to touch base on internalized racism. Um, there's a body of research that has looked at the ways in which in some subgroup of my disadvantaged, stigmatized populations accept as true the dominant society's ideology of their group. Um, research in the United States suggests about a third of blacks score high on internalized racism. By the way, uh, about a third of blacks have, if you did the IAT test, implicit association test is a measure that captures unconscious bias, about a third of blacks score high on anti-black bias. Other than blacks, which is a third, for the rest of American society, is 70 to 80 percent. 70 percent of all racial ethnic groups, 70 to 80 percent of all professional groups, law, doctors, lawyers, teachers, policemen, whatever group has been looked at, it's always between that 70 to 80 percent figure. The only exception is blacks, where it's still one in three, because it's not about What's in your skin color is, it's about what's in your mind. What are the exposures you have had that you've internalized? I don't, I'm gonna skip quickly. Oh, let me talk quickly about the impact of this discrimination and the culture's negative stereotypes on discrimination in our society. Back in 1999, Congress asked the National Academy of Medicine, what's called the Institute of Medicine in those days, to answer a simple question. When a black person and a white person goes into a healthcare context in the United States, does your race determine the quality and intensity of care that you receive? Get the point? It's not access to care, but the quality and intensity of care. That's what I looked like back then, 2003, when the report came out. Uh, that's the compliments of the Washington Post, our national press conference. 
What did we find? The Institute of Medicine report that is called Unequal Treatment, published in 2003, found that across virtually every therapeutic intervention, from the most simple procedure, an example of a simple procedure, a patient is in the emergency department with a mild stroke. Does the patient get aspirin? If you're a minority, you're less likely to get aspirin. But let me give you an example. Dr. Todd was an emergency room physician at UCLA Medical Center. He asked a simple question. When a patient comes into the UCLA emergency department with a long bone fracture, a broken bone in the arm or legs, does your ethnicity determine whether you get pain medication? You get the point? Patient with a broken bone, does your ethnicity determine whether you get pain medication? 55% of Latinos treated at UCLA in the prior year did not receive pain medication with a broken bone in the arm or legs compared to 26% of whites. Dr. Todd statistically adjusted for every possible other factor, whether this person spoke English, whether it got injured on the job, what time they showed up at the ER, how long they spent in the ER, how severe was the fracture. The single biggest predictor, once everything was adjusted for, is tell me the ethnicity of the patient, and that Latinos were seven and a half times less likely to get pain medication and final models. Dr. Todd moved to Emory University in Atlanta and repeated the same study at three large emergency rooms in Atlanta looking at black and white patients and found exactly the same thing. A black person with a broken bone in the arm or legs goes to the emergency room is less likely to get pain medication. Now folks, don't focus on pain medication. I just use that as an illustration. This has been documented in every area of medicine. There are more studies in the treatment of cardiovascular disease, the number one killer in this country than anything else. And there are studies that show this also exists in the treatment of mental health care. Here is one study that f followed patients over time, and after adjusting for the severity that the patients had, the dangerousness, the psychiatric history, the use of restraints, the time in the ER, black patients received more psychiatric medication, and black clinicians spent less time to evaluate black patients. Um, however, the tendency to over-medicate black patients was lower when clinicians engaged the patient in treatment. So this is just one example of these disparities exist in psychiatric care as well. But we are left with this core paradox. How is it possible that in a country with arguably the best trained workforce, where providers wake up every day intending to do their best for all of their patients, can nonetheless produce a pattern of care that appears to be so discriminatory? The IOM committee concluded that the most likely explanation was implicit bias or unconscious discrimination or unthinking discrimination. Different terms are used, it's all the same, but there was a robust body of social psychological research, decades old, that found it's not about physicians, it's not about Americans, it's not about white people, it's about how human beings process information. And it's this, if we hold a negative stereotype about a group in our mind, and we meet someone that we identify with that group, in less time than it takes to blink our eye, one third of the time it takes to blink an eye, our eye, we make a judgment about that person and we'll treat them differently. It's an automatic process, it's an unconscious process, and it happens even among people who are not prejudiced. It's part of the human condition. I like to tell my students that I think of myself as a prejudiced person. I think of myself as a prejudiced person because I think of myself as a normal human being. And if you are a normal human being, you are most probably prejudiced. I didn't say you are racially prejudiced because race is only one basis of it. Because this is a process of social categorization. Every society, every culture has in-groups and out-groups groups that are viewed positively and groups that are viewed negatively. And when you meet someone from a group that your socialization told you to view negatively, these processes occur. So you may not have racial prejudice, but what are your stereotypes about gay people, about fat people, about poor people, about old people, about women? The question is, these are natural, normal processes that occur, and I'm showing you here, research shows in one third of the time it takes to blink your eye, these processes are triggered. I talked about internalized racism already, so I'm gonna move on. The point I am making is, all of these mechanisms of, this, of racism, segregation, institutional, individual discrimination, and the discrimination in the culture 
leads to inequities across a broad range of domains. There are responses and, and, and collective resources and responses to them. And the existence of these inequities confirms for many the stereotypes. And the stereotypes go back to reinforce the system of racism in the first place. What can we do about these things? We need to reduce implicit bias is one of the things we need to do. By the way, implicit bias is not the only type of discrimination. There is discrimination that is explicit, considerable, deliberate, intentional. But implicit bias is a very common form that many people are unaware of. Implicit bias can be reduced under certain conditions. Here is a high quality study from the United Kingdom. Double blind parallel group placebo control. A single dose of a beta blocker reduces implicit bias for the next hour. <laughs> this is true, high quality evidence. By the way, this illustrates something that's powerful and important because we have two occupants of the White House, both the president and vice president, said that implicit bias during the campaign was fake news because Hillary Clinton mentioned it, and they said it's fake news. It's not real. The fact that we can intervene on it with a pharmacologic intervention illustrates and documents that this is a real phenomenon in the brain that can actually be intervened on with a, uh, with a pharmacologic intervention. I don't think, though, that we want to medicate our whole population <laughs> on a regular basis, multiple times a day for the rest of their life. So are there other options? Yes, there are studies out of social psychology that shows multiple uh, prejudice reducing strategies like stereotype replacing, counter stereotype imaging. Counter stereotype imaging is um, if you think of all women as weak at night, just before you go to sleep, just, just imagine what a strong woman would look like. Just, just picture uh, a strong woman in operation. That's their individuation. We all process complex cognitive information by putting them in, into categories. Social categorization is our default, what all humans do. Individuation says, I will resist the temptation when I meet someone to focus first on their gender, age, and race. Those are the three characteristics we focus on in this one third of, of the time it takes us to blink our eye and try to focus on the unique characteristics of this individual. See the person as a new person and try to understand them as a person and don't make a shorthand judgments about them based on their race, their age, and their gender. Perspective taken, increasing interracial contact. I'd like to point to the Divine Solution. Uh, Professor Patricia Devine for the University of Wisconsin at Madison has shown you can put all of these strategies into a program and people can be motivated to increase their awareness of bias, increase their concerns about bias, implement these multiple strategies, and they are successful in reducing uh, implicit bias and the effects remains for up to three months. So it's possible for these things to be done. However, we need to go beyond cultural competence to also address structural competence. What do I mean by that? The implicit bias at the individual level affects us when we have sat in decision-making rooms establishing policies. So there are lots of policies and procedures that exist that were based on implicit biases, and we need to be aware of them and effectively dismantling racism in our society requires us to I, I dismantle the institutional legacies and the social consequences that exist. I want to also talk about the importance of building resilience to re address racism through policy. Oftentimes we talk about racism, uh, resilience, but we think of it only at the level of the individual, how we make that individual stronger. We can impact social policy. Here is how the US ranks on childhood poverty, 34th in the world on childhood poverty. And childhood poverty is patterned by race. One third of, of, Latin, of uh, African American and Native American kids are poor. One quarter of Latino kids are poor. 11% of white and Asian kids are poor. Here is an important chart from UNICEF. This is child poverty before taxes and transfers and after taxes and transfers. So let's look at the case of Ireland. In Ireland, the economic system in Ireland produces child poverty rates of 42%. Taxes and transfers reflect the values, the policy preferences of a society, the decisions we make of how we will allocate resources to improve the lives of our citizens. So after the 
Irish have put their policies into place, child poverty is reduced from 42% to 8%. In the US, the economy produces a child poverty rate of 24%. And after our policy preferences are put in place, it's reduced by one percentage point. So there's a lot that we can do. Improving America's health, we need to start early. There's high quality scientific evidence, like the Abbasidarian Project, that shows when we implement an early childhood program, birth through five, high quality intellectual stimulation, medical care, good nutrition, at age 35, there are remarkable differences in risk factors for heart disease here, the systolic blood pressure differences linked to just what we provided kids birth through five. We also need to improve economic well-being. We have high quality scientific evidence in the last 60 years when the black-white gap in income has narrowed, the black-white gap in health has narrowed. So economic policy is a health policy. We also need to improve in neighborhood and housing conditions. We have high quality evidence, and I want to give you a dramatic example of how this can be done. The East Lake Meadows, this is a purpose-built communities initiative in Atlanta. It took a public housing project where 90% of the families were victims of a felony every year. Public housing, African American, um, uh, only 13% of adults stably employed, one of the worst performing schools in the state of Georgia. And purpose-built communities, um, this is the villages of East Lake today, tore down the housing project, built a new housing project. There's been a 90% reduction in violent crime. It's high quality housing. 50% of the residents still qualify uh, for public housing, 50% at market rate. All able-bodied persons are employed. The school is one of the best performing in the, in the state of Georgia. It shows it can be done and purpose-built communities is providing free technical assistance to any community in the United States who wants to replicate their model. It can be done, we can transform our neighborhoods. Let me close by saying what is holding us back. We have high quality evidence of interventions that would make a difference. What's the elephant in the room? Why aren't we making more progress? Number one, most adult Americans are unaware that racial inequalities in health even exist. Many are indifferent, some are dis de delusional. What do Americans view as the cause of racial inequities in health? This is a, from a national study conducted in October of this year. Americans were asked, blacks, we would eliminate all inequities in the United States Blacks would do as well as whites if they only tried harder. 42% of Americans believe that just blacks working harder would solve the problem. 72% of Republicans, 23% of Democrats. Among whites, 45%, 43% of Latinos, and even 24% of African Americans think the problem can be solved by just working harder. There are dramatic differences in subgroups of whites. So among white men, 52% believe that just working harder would solve it. Among white women, it's 39%. Among whites with less than a college degree, 51%. Whites with a college degree or more education, 33%. Um, what else is the problem? W.E.B. Du Bois, great African-American social scientist, Harvard alum, wrote a book called The Philadelphia Negro, has a chapter in that book on Negro health. And in his chapter on Negro health, as he comes to the end after reciting all the statistics I just gave you in 1899, he says the most difficult social problem in the matter of Negro health is the peculiar attitude of the nation toward the well-being of the race. And Du Bois continued, there have been few other cases in the history of civilized peoples where human suffering has been viewed with such peculiar indifference. That peculiar indifference, researchers today study, and they call it the empathy gap, and it's well documented that the population of the United States has less empathy and concern for the problems of African Americans and other minorities compared to others. Uh, racism exists in multiple forms, has pervasive negative consequences. We need to redouble our efforts to mitigate its negative effects, but our biggest need is political will and support to dismantle its societal structures and to create that political will to make a difference. I leave you with two quotations. Martin Luther King said, true compassion is more than flinging a coin to a beggar. It understands that an edifice which produces beggars needs restructuring. There are many edifices producing beggars.
And then finally, I leave you with the words of Robert F. Kennedy. Each time a man or woman stands up for an ideal, or acts to improve the lot of others, or strikes out against injustice, he or she sends forth a tiny ripple of hope. And those ripples can build a current which can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. I believe that each of you today can leave this place and be a tiny ripple of hope. And together, we can sweep down the mighty walls of oppression and resistance that exists in our communities. Thank you very much. I think we have about five minutes for questions. Hi, I'm, I'm afraid I do have a comment, but I'd like your response. You said earlier that the system in segregation was functioning as it was intended. My premise to you as a strong political activist is that this entire system was built, you implicitly say, and I want to make it explicit, on genocide, slavery, and white supremacy. And those values of the core elements of this system are now being unveiled and revealed through the fascists that we have um, in this government. So I would like to know from you, what do you think about my statement that the basically slow genocide of black and brown people in this country through mass incarceration, shooting down of black and brown people, and all the devastating data that you have and you know, that this is the system working exactly as it was intended? I, and I wonder what you think. I, I think we've, we're saying the same thing in different words. I mean, that's my point, that racism is premised on an ideology, the ideology of inferiority that disvalues and disempowers, and so I, I, I think we're saying the same thing. I, I don't disagree with what you've said. Another brave soul? <laughs> I see two people coming forward. Um, I kind of just wanted to hear your thoughts about um, mental health treatment um, within the United States right now. I, uh, there was a lot talked about about physical health and kind of what that does, but then also talked about um, um, from the discrimination and everything going on, how it affects um, mental health and minorities. And so I kind of wanted to hear what you have to say about it. I know, you know, there is not a lot of resources um, that really has been, I don't, I don't want to say successful, but I do want to say that it's not as common for people or minorities to get mental health now and, um, and also for children when it really does matter. And so I just kind of wanted to hear what you have to say around this. So thank you for the question. Um, yes, um, I think I showed one slide of physical health or dis discrimination, physical health treatment. I showed one slide of discrimination in mental health treatment. There's lots of studies about discrimination in mental health. Um, there are studies that show, there's a historical literature that shows that with black and white patients showing up with the identical symptom profile, uh, they are diagnosed differently. Now, there's some evidence suggests that that is tending to decrease over time. Uh, similar patterns have been done in research in, in the United Kingdom. That's also, those patterns also exist there, uh, a link to race. Um, uh, with treatment, we, we have two things. One is um, minorities, for good historic reasons, um, uh, are, are more reluctant to seek particularly mental health treatment, more so than physical health. It's true for physical health, but it's the, the, the disparity is even stri more, more striking for, for, for um, uh, mental health. So that's one. But two, the availability of accessible community health treatment in the communities, mental health treatment where, where individuals reside is, is also a problem. So we have issues of access, but we even for those who enter treatment, there are issues of quality of care. So yes, do we need um, strategies of improving uh, the, uh, um, the quantity and availability and accessibility to medical care? Absolutely, yes. Another quick question that may be our last, I'm not sure. Okay, thank you. Um, I work for this Commonwealth of Massachusetts overseeing uh, funds, HUD funds that come out to provide permanent supportive housing for disabled formerly homeless people who need a lot of care. And I, I was very interested in your East Lake um, slide. I know that in Section 8 also that there is some movement to get people uh, into neighborhoods with 
that are wealthier. Um, do you know anybody who's working on, on fair market rent? Because right now we are limited to fair market rent for the housing that uh, agencies provide. And the rent means that people are living in the poorest of neighborhoods always. Yeah, I, I think East Lake, um, you'd have to look at it more. It's if you Google purpose built communities, the former mayor of Atlanta is the chair of the board. Of, of, of the purpose-built model. Their model brought together a new reality uh, of collaboration between the public housing department, the local community leaders who lived in that neighborhood, and a, a wealthy philanthropist who looked, drove through East Lake and said, this is incredible. People in the United States shouldn't be living like that. So it, it took those three partners together, um, and they have a model with a community quarterback. They need an, an, a local agency, uh, organization that will be the quarterback for this initiative, but they have a model by this work which works. Purpose-built communities, uh, I think, would be a one way. But it, it's, it's going beyond the normal system. They, they, they broke the rules. They're not following the normal rules. They, they're creating a new reality where, where they can produce that kind of change. Right, and, and HUD creates a reality where people can only live in very poor neighborhoods. So, um, right, so then they, they are we're working with the housing, public housing department, but they're going beyond it to create a new reality. That's probably all I could say. One last quick question, and I'll... Um, I just want to say thank you, and my question is, um, what do you think needs to happen in order to see more kind of black minorities in scholarly roles and in professional roles that um, children growing up can look up to and kind of see and, and, and want to portray that? Wow. <laughs> um, we need a lot of change. Uh, I'll give you a statistic. I um, wrote a commentary about it. Uh, Association of American Medical Colleges is your report in 2016. In 2015, there were fewer African American males in the first year of medical school than in 1978. In 1965, 3.2% of all physicians in the United States were black. In 2014, 3.9% of all physicians in the United States are black. Now, the denominator has changed, so there are a lot more physicians, but as a proportion of the whole, we haven't made as much progress as most people think. And so there's work to be done, and what schools like Harvard and other uh, elite institutions need to do, we need to get much more engaged in working on the pipeline. We're very good at trying to cream the crop late in the, state, in the game as opposed to building the pipeline so we prepare individuals from elementary and high school because segregation produces inferior quality education. The single biggest predictor of student performance in the United States according to the Education Trust is teacher quality. And what we have in the United States is the best teachers are teaching the students with the least need. And so we, we need to transform education. We could fund education differently than we do it. Other countries, like Canada, funds education at the provincial level. At the provincial level, you allocate resources to places of greater need. We, fund, we let local property determine the economic resources available to a local school system. It's a perverse system that we have put in place. But I think there's a lot that we can do, even from our institutional context, of trying to build a pipeline so black and brown kids. Whoa, let me tell you one reason why this is so important. Come with me to 2060. In 2060, many of us in this room will be on Social Security. Or dead. Or dead, yes. <laughs> but some of us will still be on Social Security. For every person receiving Social Security benefits, there'll be only two people paying into the system. One of those two will be black or Latino. They are in kindergarten today. So if we want a social security system to be economically viable when we are ready to receive benefits and to provide for us in our time, we need to do everything that we can to ensure that those black and Latino and Native American kids are getting the highest quality education, are prepared to thrive in the economy to work hard, make a lot of money, so that our future will be secure. Thank you very much.